Hi, y'all. Anthea Scoopis, Engagement and Education Director at Lead Center of Kansas, and um, excited to welcome you all to another leadership conversation. Um, today, I'm really uh, excited to have um, some friends and colleagues um, that I'm going to introduce you to. I've worked with them a few years now, and it's always a pleasure. Uh, Peter Yasso, the director of the Kansas Creative Arts Industry Commission. Joshua Miner, professor in KU's Film and Media Studies program. And Casey Messick, the curator of global indigenous art at Spencer Museum of Art. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the Indigenous Arts Initiative, which is a partnership uh, between the KCAIC, KU's Film and Media Studies program, the Spencer Museum of Art, and the Lead Center of Kansas. Um, the overall idea of this program is to bring accomplished Indigenous artists to KU to present workshops for early to mid-career uh, Indigenous artists. Um, and then while here at KU, we, we kind of incorporate those artists into lectures and panels and film showings. Uh, we usually try to connect that as well into the um, KU's powwow and Indigenous Cultures Festival around the same time. So, um, I would like to ask the esteemed guests, um, just like to hear from you all, what your impressions of this project ha have been so far? Uh, Casey, you wanna start? Sure. Um, I was very involved um, in the project a few years ago with Stephen Grounds, a muralist from Oklahoma, um, and Sydney Purcell, uh, who's a member of the Iowa tribe and she's based in Missouri. Um, and what I thought was really unique was the mentorship aspect of this program. So a lot of artist residencies come and sort of the artist is the expert and they create work, share work, and then leave the community. Um, but what I thought was really great was that Sydney and Stephen were here for two weeks working together. Um, and Stephen was, was the more established artist. But as I got to watch them work together, what I thought was really neat was the way that they were learning from each other um because they have very different artistic practices um and so Stephen was really bringing this public art mural component to it whereas a lot of sydney's work is very community engaged and education oriented so it was a perfect pairing for a university setting and, and for the community in lawrence um so yeah. I'll, I'll stop there on that one yeah that's nice um joshua you want to chime in yeah i think uh, you know one thing that's been interesting is to is to see the the program sort of change over time and, and what we started by imagining um, as a not only I mean, of course, a mentorship heavy program, but one that really um, over time has come to serve, I think, more people. So uh, in this second year, although it's it's taken some months to figure out how that would be navigated this year, um, seeing uh, our visiting guests really be able to work with more community members, uh, more students. Uh, from both uh, Haskell and KU, but then also just, you know, people from Lawrence. Um, and in fact, the workshop this year, I think we had a couple of people come in um, remotely from, I think we had one guest from Omaha who participated in the animation workshop. So I think the big challenge, you know, from here on out will be um, finding ways to really get Native community members from Lawrence and elsewhere into production spaces um, at the Film and Media Studies Department, because that's been something that's been really important to me, but that's been difficult to do thus far um, as the program has changed, right? We're kind of moving more in that direction. So. Sure, sure. And especially difficult when we're in the midst of a quarantine. Right. Yeah. Um, so Peter, I'd like to get your perspective from the uh, kind of the other side of all of this um, and looking back into it from KCAIC's standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I think what is, you know, kind of building on what has been said, I mean, what's been great about it is the different levels of engagement. So you have artists learning from artists in a mentorship capacity, um, but then you also have them engaging with the community um, as a whole and how we can look and see, you know, to grow that over time, both um, with community engagement, but also across um, disciplines. Um, but I think, you know, part of the goal is also to really um, create a place where artists can meet each other and have Kansas and the resources that we have here kind of known for a place where people can connect um, on a national level. Um, and, and I think that's been successful so far. Yeah, nice. I mean, I think that's been one of the great things um, that the Kansas creative arts industry has allowed that um, the artists don't 
necessarily the the young artist and, and uh, mid career artists don't necessarily have to be from Kansas. That is more regional and and that's appreciated because um, yeah, that's just a better way of attracting more of our native artists into the area. And 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 then being able to access the resources here at KU are an important part of that as well. So I wonder if any of you, I mean, we've had to adapt this program the two years we've done, we've adapted quite a bit. And I imagine we'll keep adapting it until we figure it out. Kind of wasn't fair this year because we really had to adapt it because of, uh, of COVID. Um, but I'm wondering if any of you have thought about where you kind of see this program heading or leading to, or, you know, maybe if it were in the, in a perfect, if we've, if we led it to the perfect place, what would it look like? Any thoughts? I think one of the things that's really important for me is just providing an authentic platform for Indigenous artists to share what they're doing, um, especially with other Natives in the creative field, um, while also allowing kind of the insight for members who are outside of those communities to learn about, um, you know, whether it's Indigenous aesthetics or, you know, digital animation. Um, you know, I, I love the way that this is combining kind of both of those elements. Um, and ideally what I would like to see is that Lawrence and Northeast Kansas is really seen as a, a hub for creative indigenous um, expression. You know, we're home to the four tribes of Kansas now and they're all concentrated um, kind of in our region. And so, you know, thinking about it um, on a statewide level, I really love thinking that we could have um, not only the visibility, but have the, the ability to um, stand behind what we're doing. Um, yes. Support it. Yeah. Support it. Yeah. Um, and, and make it grow. And again, I think this idea of supporting, giving people platforms and some latitude to do what they think is important um, with it. And I know that one of the original impetuses behind the program was, um, you know, to, to address things like Indigenous leadership and bringing skills back to um, you know, people's home communities so that we can see the tendrils of this grow, um, you know, more broadly, but that Kansas really does emerge and Lawrence and KU and Haskell um, as incubators of these ideas. Yeah, I, I think too that what you were saying really ties beautifully into what we try to accomplish around the Indigenous Cultures Festival, right? That is a huge um, educational component, working really closely with, with uh, scholars like Jen Cita Warrington and other uh, native scholars and experts in our area, um, you know, with a committee that creates that programming, right, that is, that is actually more indigenous than non-indigenous. Um, and um, this program I see ties very specifically to that, the festival, but is, is its own entity as well. Yeah. And sort of growing that. So allowing it to be its own, but also um, sort of um, embedding it into the to festival as well. Yeah, if, if I could echo something that that um, that both of you have said, you know, one of the joys of this year, one of the surprises was that, you know, in the the first year we did this, I think the impression amongst all the artists really was that we were bringing in a a a, a well known working artist to come into town and sort of teach people here. They were bringing their celebrity into this space, and you know, uh, something that Joseph said to me during this workshop um, last weekend was that he he was surprised to find that there were already talented artists here, right? That there was something that he discovered when he participated here and that this was really more about establishing professional networks yeah. for artists that were here that maybe didn't have, uh, I mean, they may, may have regional recognition, but they don't, they, they don't have those kind of national connections that I think that this actually provides. Uh, and our, our guests from other states, our guests from Omaha, who's a working professional there, uh, was able to also sort of join in those connections. And yeah. so that's been kind of an interesting surprise to me. Yeah, that is, that's wonderful, actually. I never thought of that perspective. Um, I do think, too, it just depends on who the artists are and what the form is, right? So the most recent workshop, the other most recent workshop with Dana, with Dana Warrington, um, who is a, a, an amazing artist, folk artist, and just a master quiller, uh, he gave a quilling workshop to about six uh, local native artists, all of whom really, you know, Mona Cliff and others who are already recognized in our community as in their state as uh, wonderful artists. But this is a very specific form 
that not many people know about because it's been lost, right? The knowledge of it. And there's a, there's a, there folks are careful about sharing that knowledge so that it's not misused. Um, so, you know, that's sort of a different example, but that's really passing down um, the history of that kind of art form, which is amazing as well. Peter, do you have some something to add to this? You don't yeah, have I, to. <laughs> yeah, I think you know that network building is really is really key as well, which is why I'm a big believer in having these kinds of things open nationally. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of times people don't necessarily think of Kansas when they think of uh, indigenous conversations or Latino conversations or African American conversations, but there's no reason why they shouldn't, given the resources and the history that we have here. And I think these kind of programs help open that up. Um, and help create those networks. And I also think like having the ability to um, innovate in these areas and really having hopefully that the, the, this program leads to this area being seen as innovators in these different disciplines and art forms uh, and in this community is I think also important. So that kind of leads to a question I wanted to ask you, Peter, um, if you would, wouldn't mind filling folks in a little bit more on some of the other collaborations, partnerships you have throughout the state in the same sort of format, but with different genres. Yeah, I think a classic example is the new play lab that we do with the Inch Festival down in Independence. Um, again, that's open nationally. So we bring in 25 playwrights from across the country who get to um, have their plays read uh, by professional regional actors, uh, get them workshopped by the pop by the the public down there, as well as some professional responders, and then they always honor a, a Broadway luminary, so they get to do workshops with them as well. But and that gets that I mean it, that's in its fifth year, and it's really becoming um, a staple of um, the emerging playwright scene, if you will. Um, and that really gets, again, Kansas known as a place where people can come and innovate, gets us part of the national conversation in playwriting. Um, the New Dance Lab, which is, you know, again, brings in uh, nationally known choreographers uh, to work with dance companies here. Um, our arts and medicine program, which gets art therapists out to institutions. Uh, we have one of the oldest art therapy programs in the country. Uh, one of, I think, only five um, drama therapy um, programs uh, in the country. So a lot of resources that I don't think people necessarily think about when they think about Kansas. Um, and this allows us to really kind of insert ourselves into the national conversation in, in all these different areas. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, so um, I was wondering if Joshua could talk a little bit because you've had opportunity to do two very distinct film workshops with two different filmmakers. Um, and kind of love to hear your, um, your impression, um, what worked, what didn't, or um, how you see that moving forward. Or maybe, it's, maybe it depends on the, who the filmmaker is as well, combination of all those things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I mean, I can speak to a few things that are coming to mind. One is, is um, over time, what's, what's kind of surfaced for me uh, as, as a focus, I think, moving forward is community which I think was something left a little bit by the wayside in the beginning, uh, at least on the film side and the way that we, we conceived of this sort of mentor relationship and, and the resources that we had to bring, uh, you know, an esteemed filmmaker like Sterling Harjo to town to have him work with a young filmmaker from Haskell, which, which worked. Um, but, you know, there's so much about the filmmaking process that is communal, right? That, that involves people getting together to share skills and ideas um, and a vision that I feel like um, really came a little bit closer to fruition this time around. So, we, you know, this time around we lucked out on the film side because we planned an animation workshop that worked really well when, you know, despite the COVID constraints. So animators were able to work remotely in a way that if this had been a traditional filmmaking workshop, we would have had to completely reimagine what was possible. So in a, in a way we lucked out, the timing kind of worked for us in that regard, but the community, I think, was some was a big improvement this time around. We had a small group of animators, but they were all able to work really intimately with Joseph and with each other to help on each other's projects, to share skills. You know, some of our animators were really talented editors, film editors, and they were able to work on other projects while receiving help of other kinds. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that community is something that I that I think will look to privilege next uh, next year. Yeah. And I'd, I'd really like to do um, return to a kind of traditional filmmaking workshop, but have a larger group of people participate on uh, on either one or a couple of projects 
and really put the resources, the wonderful resources we have here available at the film and media studies department, the production spaces, the recording studio. I mean, these, these were all resources that we couldn't use right. um, this year and didn't use a whole lot the first year either. So I'd really like to um, kind of get moving in those spaces. It kind of sounds like we're going to have to be adaptive every year and it depends on, you know, I thought maybe Casey, you can talk a little bit, but I thought the format when you were working with Steven, working with, with um, Sydney was a great format and, and was really interesting to see that process. And then there was this amazing product too, that we actually have still outside of the lead center. Um, I thought that worked well, but I do, but I do like that idea of community and, and art, artists coming together to work and building building relationships. I saw that with Dana Warrington and his quilling workshop. The women who took that are are still getting together and practicing uh, and talking to Dana. He said, you know, they've been talking and and so that to me is super exciting, right? But um, can you talk a little bit? And Joshua's obviously too that the community was an important part. But but maybe with visual art, sometimes it's a little different. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I really like about the program so far is is how adaptable we're, we've been able to be, either for external reasons like a pandemic um, or just kind of rolling with the unexpected things that happen when you, you know, bring artists to town for long periods of time and you're working with groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the visual arts have, can have a reputation for sort of being singular, um, uh, products, right? Like an artist creates a thing and they work a lot of times artists work alone or maybe with a studio assistant. Um, and what I liked about the model with Stephen and Sydney, even though they were working on painting a mural, um, they were out talking to members of the community as part of that. And one of the things that we've talked about is that we have not prescribed for as part of this initiative what type of artists we bring in. Um, so I work in the visual arts at the Spencer Museum, um, but Anthea, obviously you work in performing arts, Joshua's in film. Um, and I love that we're keeping it open to bring in different forms of creative expression. And I think that by necessity, what these workshops look like are gonna have to change based on the particular artists we're bringing in and the format that they're working on. But I think given the importance of community and network building, um, both for the artists and members of the community, but also for us at KU. Um, it's really great to have these kind of alliances with um, KCAIC, but also with each other on campus. Um, I think that having the ability to bring in artists that can engage different partners and in different ways is really exciting. Um, you know, so KU has a fairly newly formed um, interdisciplinary ceramics research center. Um, and it would be really great to bring in an indigenous ceramicist and connect with them. Um, you know, Haskell also has a ceramics program, the Lawrence Art Center. So thinking about media and people who work in those media as ways to bring out different community aspects around those works of art. Um, I know we've talked a lot about photography and the capacity there um, to kind of engage um, engage more people, it's very accessible. So I love that flexibility and openness that everyone um, has had. Yeah, yeah. And thinking about other genres too, I know that one that I would really love to um, incorporate into this is, is dance and sort of that marriage of, um, especially tied to the powwow as well, sort of the, 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 the marriage of uh, traditional powwow dance and contemporary dance. There's a lot of amazing contemporary uh, indigenous companies out there well, maybe not a lot, but there are a number of, of very good ones. And, and I love the idea of sort of exploring that with um, some of our traditional powwow dancers. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting things that could happen. And um, I think it's just gonna take um, um, us continuing the collaboration, finding more money, uh, you know, the usual things that, that make those things happen. Um, but I guess I should just ask you all um, what, I, maybe I just listed some of them. What do you see are some of the barriers or challenges that we're gonna have in the next few years to kind of make this happen and, and more fully realize it? Peter, you wanna start with that or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, funding is always a, you know, probably um, in terms of a barrier, but I think, I mean, other than that, I mean, I really think that, um, you know, hopefully that the reputation of it continues to grow that the um, 
uh, the amount of people that want to participate, the level of artists that want to participate will only increase over time. So I don't, I don't know that I see too many barriers in that regard. Um, and I also think that, you know, the section of the state will also start to embrace um, and really want to do a lot more partnerships as, as it picks up, because they'll see the value in, in sort of, you know, what this area is becoming known for. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's kind of where I see it going. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Joshua? I'm thinking less about barriers um, and more about how this moment of COVID has actually, I think, if I'm looking at it optimistically, because it hasn't been especially friendly to arts organizations, um, you know, we can't gather. Um, you know, I've barely been in the museum that I work at since March. Um, but I also think that we've learned, one, how important art and film and dance are as um, connectors um, and at bringing people together. Um, and also that we're exploring new, new modes of engagement. Um, a year ago, if you know, you'd said, could we have a Zoom interview, I would have thought it was really weird and strange and tr wanting to troubleshoot it for a half an hour beforehand to make sure I understood the technology, whereas now I'm attending lectures in Amsterdam. Um, and I, I hope that some of this openness and, um, you know, willingness to experiment and redefine, for instance, what a residency is when people can't travel. That's something I'm thinking about right now, hoping that this will actually allow us to be more creative and open um, moving forward, because um, I do think it's a way to actually address some of the barriers, like Peter mentioned, funding, um, you know, a lot of Native uh, and Indigenous people have commitments to family, to their home, traveling and leaving their jobs or their families for five, six, seven, 14 days to do residency might have, might have been a barrier. Um, and so I, I'm actually feeling optimistic about the ways that we can use the arts to forge human connection um, moving forward. But ask me tomorrow and I might be crying. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think those are really good valid points. I was thinking that same thing when we're talking about um, um, being able to, to connect with our more rural communities, um, that we're finding ways to do that right now, right? And, it, and it's not the same thing as in person, but it's still making those connections and providing those opportunities. And so I, I, I see Zoom being in my future and my engagement future for the rest of my career, for sure. Joshua, do you have any anything to yeah, add? Yeah, I mean, I would really echo what what the two of you have just said. I mean, I think you know at this point it feels like this this year has really fast forwarded um, my my uh, movement into really learning to be creative, and I think a lot of the barriers moving forward with and this is something that's new to me, being on this side of things and and trying to you know you, you, most of you are old hats at this, but. This was this has been a learning experience for me, learning to be creative at, uh, and you know, creative with everything from the from how we organize things to the formatting of the actual workshops. I think that's been something that, you know, learning to be light on my feet, yeah. uh, learning to um, imagine new ways of doing uh, work in the arts um, has been um, one of the interesting things about this year that I think you know will be important to consider uh, next year and moving forward. And I think. You know, you all pointed to some reasons that these barriers were already here for a lot of Native people. Artists can't afford, you know, with day jobs to come and stay here for 14 days, and that's a prohibitive barrier. Well, we're, we're going through that creative process now of learning how to address those needs, I think, after the fact. So yeah. it's very true. And it's true for, for the participants. It's true for us because we're all arts, arts organizations and part of, of areas that don't necessarily have, you know, um, gobs of money, right? So this kind of form, like what we were doing with the Joseph workshop, especially, is very, very much less expensive than if we had had him here in person. So right. that is kind of interesting to explore those things. So I know we only have a, a minute or two left. I just wanted to know if, if folks had any um, kind of closing comments or anything else that they would like to add. Um, Casey, I know for sure you need to maybe scoot off. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? I think just thanks um, to all of you here. Um, you know, I I have been working with artists and doing residencies for years, Joshua, but um, this was a first for me too. Um, and I'm just really thankful. I've learned a lot. Um, I've learned a lot from all of you, but especially from the artists and the people who have participated in the project. So 
um, just really grateful that I'm, I'm having this opportunity to explore and grow myself. Yeah, thank you. Peter, yeah. you have any? Yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of echo those statements. It's been really great to, to work in this kind of um, collaborative way and just being able to sort of um, uh, even adjusting from year one to year two and then adjusting to the virtual thing. I, you know, it's, it's, it bodes well for the future. I think that the, the program will be successful because all of us are able to um, adapt. Um, and then hearing the stories uh, of, um, you know, the, the, the mentorship and the mutual benefit of both of those artists is really, you know, kind of why we do it in the first place. And so it's, it's great to hear that. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to the program growing and continuing. Yeah, thank you. Joshua, anything? Yeah, I'm, and like all of you, I think I would echo those thanks. Uh, you know, I just wanted to share that uh, one of the real um, special parts of this year was sitting in on the workshop in a way that I didn't get to do last year. And that owed largely to the format that I was able to sit in and participate and to see those relationships be born and to receive sort of private messages from Joseph and, and the participants about what they were what they were sharing right in the workshop and how how they were sort of connecting and the intimacy that they were building over their work uh, and the confidence that these you, you know artists were gaining as they worked with Joseph and to see his attentive care it was that was it was just unbelievable to see that so I, I really enjoyed and was very thankful to be there to witness those relationships sort of emerging um, in a way that was really special. So I hope that that continues and I look forward to it next year. Yeah, I found the same thing with Dana Warrington's workshop as well. Um, there was a real bond with the participants. They've created their own group, um, mm -hmm. but, there, but there's also a bond between them and Dana and a lot of respect. He was really impressed, especially by a couple of them. Um, and yeah, it was just fun to be, um, sort of a little mouse in that room and experience that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I just, it's been a joy to work with everyone and, um, I look forward to this, uh, continuing and growing it and seeing where, where we, where we go, where we go with it. Yeah. So, um, so thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Joshua. Casey had to leave us for another meeting, but, uh, thank her as well. And uh, I'm sure we'll all be in touch again soon. Okay. Yeah, that's good. All right. Thanks. Great. Stay well. Likewise. Yeah, you too. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.